Hello, welcome to the uh, Australian Strategic Policy Institute Strategic Vision 2020. I'm Stan Grant. I'm going to be your host and moderator. I'm the lucky one. I get to sit here and to speak to remarkable people over the coming weeks about the state of our world, about the challenges that our world faces with incredible thinkers who have been in the driver's seat, people who have witnessed history changing and have had to make decisions that have affected all of our lives. This is the new world, isn't it? We are, we are now having to, to have a conference like this over the web. It's an indication of just how coronavirus has changed the nature of communication. It's changed the way that we interact with each other. We've gone from globalization to isolation in many cases. Borders are back. Indeed, you can say that borders now, to some degree, are our salvation, the capacity to be able to lock down and to keep the, uh, the virus at bay is absolutely crucial in our world right now. As I said, coronavirus is reshaping the way we live. It is reshaping our economies. It is reshaping global politics. Some have said it is also tilting the balance of power in our world. It is certainly accelerating change and, and is revealing some of the cracks that were appearing in our world that are much more visible to us now. We're going to have some extraordinary guests over the coming couple of days, over the coming couple of weeks. But uh, we begin today with two remarkable men, two remarkable guests who have witnessed history, who have been there, who have seen this change firsthand and have had to make extraordinary decisions in their times in power, men who have lived through remarkable times. Former Australian Prime Minister John Howard is joining us and Kim Beasley, who among other things was Defence Minister in the Hawke Labor government, a former US ambassador and now governor of Western Australia. Gentlemen, it's an absolute pleasure to begin this uh, strategic vision conference for 2020 with both of you. It's lovely to see you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Howard, I, I wanted to start with you because uh, as Scott Morrison, the prime minister said recently, we have entered a world now that is going to be poorer and more disordered. Others have said this is a much more dangerous world. How do you view this moment and the implications for our world economically, but particularly for, for this conference, particularly geopolitically and strategically? Well, uh, Stan and ladies and gentlemen, I think it's always important answering a question like that to encourage everybody to strike a sense of balance, not to pretend that the pandemic won't leave um, an imprint but equally not to go overboard and say the world will never be the same again. I think the biggest single impact of the pandemic, apart from uh, the devastation it will do to the lives of, of many uh, millions of people around the world, uh, I think the biggest impact will be uh, how it affects the governance of individual countries. I think we've already seen uh, some fairly good examples of countries that have handled it well. I think our own country um, has handled the pandemic extremely well. I think countries such as Taiwan have handled it extremely well. I think some of the European countries have done better than others. I think some have handled it poorly. I think it has affected the esteem in which the leaders of some individual countries are held. Uh, it, it's hard not to say that the the American president has not handled the pandemic well thus far. Uh, in, uh, I think that could have implications for uh, the outcome of the November election because on a, an occasion like this, the public expects the job to be done competently and clearly, irrespective of their political allegiance. And that's why you have this interesting but understandable phenomenon here in Australia that there's been a surge of support for individual um, leaders, uh, both state and federal level, uh, irrespective of their politics. You've seen Labor premiers get record approval ratings and you've seen a Liberal prime minister get very high approval ratings. Uh, this is an occasion when the public says, you face uh, a threat to the country's well-being and we will judge you at how you respond to that. If you do it well, we'll give you a tick. If you don't do it well, we may remember that when the time comes along. 
Whether it affects the ultimate balance of power in geostrategic terms is a much harder question to answer. Um, we ended the pandemic with the great rivalry being the United States and mm. China. That is still the great rivalry. And I suspect when we come out of the pandemic, it will continue to be the great rivalry because it's fundamentally there. I don't think many of the basics of power balances are going to be altered. I think it's going to affect the lives of some people a lot. It's going to, not going to touch the lives of others. So I think it is a mistake to say the world will never be the same again. Uh, I think the world will be substantially the same. I think we will have learnt the value of international cooperation. I think international cooperation has been in fits and starts on this pandemic. Uh, I don't think there's much doubt that it originated in China. I don't think there's much doubt the rest of the world thinks that China was very slow uh, in alerting the rest of the world to it. And there's a lot of disputation about the role of the World Health Organization. I don't really want to get into it because I don't know enough about the technical arguments. But my concluding message, introduction is that yes, the world will be changed, but I don't think it's going to be turned on its head. I think it's a mistake to think otherwise. Mr. Howard, as always, with your, your answers, uh, you raised so many other questions and you've touched on so much that we're going to be able to explore in the time that we have with you, notably uh, the role of nations in the world, that that America-China relationship, which is absolutely going to be critical, and, and leadership. And I want to discuss leadership a little bit later as well. But uh, Mr. Beasley, uh, something that Mr. Howard raised there, I think, which is really germane to this discussion, and that is nations are important, uh, borders are important, leadership is important. How that impacts vis-a-vis globalization and multilateralism. How do you see the world that we are living in now, the inevitable changes that we've had to make as a result of fighting COVID-19? And are there longer implications for multilateralism, globalization, uh, the rise of or, or the resurgence of nationalism? Look, I certainly think, and can I say at the outset, I can't disagree with anything really in uh, uh, Prime Minister Howard's um, characterization of the effect of the pandemic and what we need for us to take a pretty balanced view of, uh, of possible outcomes. I, I do think that this is certainly going to strengthen arguments and ideas in this country as well about uh, what these days we call sovereign capability and what in the old days we used to call self-reliance. I, I think that there is a, at least in terms of medical sphere, there wouldn't be a country uh, in the developed world that would not now be taking the view that they, uh, they need reserves of uh, protective gear, of uh, all sorts of defensive gear in relation to things like pandemics and the very minimum a determination around the globe that, uh, that people have such storm against uh, future pandemics. I think secondly, and I think this is actually a tragedy, when the I was ambassador to the United States when uh, Ebola broke out in Africa, there did not seem to be a cure to it, and it seemed to spread very rapidly. And the assumption was that it would spread far and wide. The U.S. president of the day, Obama, stepped forward and said, "We will take responsibility for this, and we will organise a response, and we'll make sure it uh, is." Um, it is dealt with. It, it, people have a cartoon view of the United States and how it relates to its allies about the US wandering around dictating to Australia, when more often than not it's the US being influenced by Australia and what we want. On this occasion, it is the only occasion in a very long political career where the US effectively gave us a direct order. Our response to their appeal was uh, well, we'd look after the Southwest Pacific, South Pacific. Their response to us was, you're ducking. Uh, this is in Africa. It's not in the South Pacific. Get on with it. So I had to ring back the Prime Minister's office and say, this is a lawful order. <laughs> we have just been told that we have to get off our collective butts and do something about it. The Prime Minister's office were a bit annoyed, and so we went in with the British and did things in Africa, not the Americans. But um, 
Nevertheless, that was America taking responsibility for the I'm afraid to say in this particular instance, you'd say it's just about the opposite. And uh, that is that is something for us to conjure with and something for us to discuss with our allies, allies as time goes by. But right through the region, there has been right through the globe, there has been a sense in which you need to develop uh, a national capability. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, our prosperity is heavily dependent on a multilateral world. Our prosperity is heavily dependent on a trading arrangement that is basically free trade. And uh, that simply is an economic dynamic that does not disappear. So there'll be a lot of nationalist type responses. There'll be a lot of effort put into enhancing your national capabilities in, in shortening supply chains or keeping supply chains within individual countries. But sooner or later, you've actually got to sell to someone if you want to prosper. There are very few nations can afford autarky, least of all us, and um, we will be, I think, as we emerge out of this misery, as we, and which we ultimately will emerge out of this misery, I think we'll be leading the charge, charge for the rules-based order and free and open trading, as we have for a long time now. Mr Howard, you've raised this question, and I, I want to spend the next uh, part of this conversation looking specifically at the relationship of China and the United States and what China means for the world. You've said in the past, you've been quoted as saying that China's rise has been good for the Chinese people and good for the world. Certainly Australia economically, it's been, uh, it's been our, it's emerged as our, our strongest economic partner, our strongest trading partner. But given what we're seeing in China, giving, given a rising authoritarianism, do you still hold to that view overall? China is good. Well, I, I do, because um, a vast country has fascinating history. It suffered enormously, perhaps far more than many Australians understand, from the ravages of World War II. And uh, although uh, I deplore the fact that it's got an authoritarian government, Australia, by and large, driven by both sides of politics in government, uh, has had I think a very pragmatic, sensible relationship with China. We have 1.3 million Australians with a Chinese heritage, uh, and uh, it's a very valuable country, but it has changed under Xi Jinping. I was prime minister during the terms in office of two of his predecessors, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao. And although they were dedicated communist leaders, don't get me wrong, uh, they looked differently on the rest of the world. They weren't as aggressive, they weren't as assertive, they didn't bully anywhere near to the same degree as does their predecessors, their successors. Uh, and that is something we have to live with. And fundamentally, the change dynamic between China and the rest of the world does have to be put at the feet of the changed attitude of the current Chinese government. I mean, you know, and I, I say that as somebody who wants Australia to keep as close as is consistent with our values with China. We must never forget how valuable China is as an export destination. Uh, we must never forget how much many Chinese families like their children studying in Australia. Australia is a safe, stable, welcoming, tolerant country. And that has been the experience of most um, Chinese students who study here. And it remains a huge foreign policy challenge for this country to strike that elusive balance. Of course, we must stand up for our values. Of course, we must repudiate any attempt to penetrate our institutions with Chinese communist propaganda. And, and that is happening. Those attempts are clearly going on. I think everything successive Australian governments have done, and which I think have by and large been supported by the current oppositions, as I, I read it. Uh, uh, all of that is good, but we must remember the end game. And the end game is to maintain, to the maximum extent consistent with our values, maintain a good economic relationship with China. And we can talk all we like about self-sufficiency or uh, greater sovereignty and about 
manufacturing more things at home. All that is fine and I'm all for it, but it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to change dramatically. And when we're out of this pandemic, pandemic, some of the enthusiasm for that is going to wane. And we're still going to look at the situation where our best export destination is China and how tremendously important it is to maintain that, consistent with all of the decisions. And I, I, I applaud the recent defence statement by the Prime Minister. Uh, I applaud the broadly bipartisan approach which is being taken to you know, a bit of resistance and pushback in relation to Chinese activity in our area. But we've got to just remember the longer term national interests of this country. And we were able to um, maintain a good relationship with China through a lot of difficult things and we've got to try and find a way of doing that now. Uh, Mr Beasley, uh, Mr Howard is right that there have been some very difficult times and of course uh, when you were serving in the Hawke Ministry um, you lived through Tiananmen Square uh, and, and of course the massacre in Tiananmen Square. How different is it now and the imperative, we hear this a lot, the imperative that Australia need not choose between our relationship with the United States and, and our trade relationship in particular with China. Is that becoming increasingly more difficult to avoid those choices? Well, I think the objective of our diplomacy and our national security policy is to be as far as we conceivably can create the conditions where we don't have to choose. I mean, no, nothing happens automatically. You actually have to have the skills to bring about a situation in which your nation is comfortable. Uh, and and it's, it's not easy in contemporary circumstances uh, to do that. Uh, it, your, your question has a very long answer and very short answers. So I will try not to, not to engage in the long answer. But we need to, in doing both, we actually have to keep a very careful eye on what is actually being done, both by uh, the Chinese leadership and by the Americans. The problem we have with the Chinese leadership at the moment, I think, is that they've actually repudiated the direction uh, of Deng Xiaoping, which is the direction which led to Chinese prosperity. And the, uh, the, the mandate, if you like, that, the, that President Xi has is a mandate built around his uh, elevating in Chinese consideration what they call their core interests, which include things like the South China Seas, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Uyghurs, what? It all, in many ways, stems from perceptions of core interest in relation to that, and that therefore he is likely to persist with these, uh, persist with these directions, and uh, uh, there's going to be a, uh, a, 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 a tendency for the rest of the globe to push back on them. The, the, these are things that are not going to be acceptable. Uh, the implementation of them around the rest of the world and how China handles that pushback is important. Then go to the United States. Now here I think we have to be extremely careful. We have to watch, particularly in the next four months, we have to watch the Americans very, very closely because the United States positions on China are differentiated and will be differentiated again after the presidential election. So right now in Congress, the biggest change since my time in Congress, uh, not in Congress, but dealing with Congress as ambassador, is that there is now a near unanimous position hostile to China on both the, the Democrat and Republican sides. And those who lead tend to be highly articulate with well-developed sense of what policy steps ought to take place. Then on the other hand, you have the administration and the alternative administration. Now, the administration in the case of, uh, uh, of President Trump is different from the position of the Republicans in Congress. Trump talks up a storm on uh, Joe Biden relationship with China and on the so-called China virus. And, uh, and he runs a very hostile uh, uh, campaign as a sub-theme of his uh, general campaign on China. But his acts are different. Whenever, he, for example, Peter Navarro, who's very anti-Chinese trade uh, um, spokesman, uh, says, well, our trade deal is dead, Trump immediately repudiates him. 
He is, he is absolutely anxious that the trade deal that has been put in place persists, not least because it means so much in some of his, uh, to some of his base in parts of the United States, point one. Point two, his company imports an enormous amount of Chinese goods, not American, and he is into the Chinese with a $250 million loan. He is, his, his position on China, whenever he is pushed to taking a really hard line stance in detail on something that China has been doing, he does not do it. And then on the other hand, you had Joe Biden, who from time to time had carriage of the relationship with China uh, under the Obama administration. And he certainly had a view then that was very similar to the sort of view that John Howard just outlined a moment ago in the context of American policy. Right now, uh, you'd say that Biden was not of that position, that he is more in line with the, the critical de uh, um, Democratic uh, and Republican congressman. But will he be after the next poll? I don't think so. And then you need the third element to all of this. The American budget is becoming unsustainable. And at some point of time, there's going to have to be a discussion there is going to be a discussion about all areas of expenditure, and that will include defence. And if you want to see little bits of an indication of where it may go, you can see now in the Senate and to a degree in the House of Representatives, there's emerging amongst progressive Democrats a critique of the size of the defence budget, and now re-emerging from the hole in which they've buried themselves for the last four years, of the Tea Party types on the Republican side who are saying something very similar. So we need to be, this is a, an occasion in which we have no simple answers. We need to be enormously careful about the steps we take. And John's absolutely right. I know the public opinion, 90% say we need to move away from our heavy orientation on, of trade towards China. But the fact of the matter is we can't. At least in no time soon can we do that. And that needs to be kept at the back of our mind. We've come out of this pandemic to some degree okay, or we're coming out to some degree okay, basically because uh, we have been able from Queensland and to a degree from, so from West Australia and to a degree from Queensland and New South Wales, we've been able to keep up our exports to China outside the student and tourism area. We would look terrible if this uh, if this at the moment was not the case mr howard there is a lot to pull apart there and we are getting a lot of commentary coming through in our questions comments that are coming through particularly talking about australian values how do we hold on to those values how do we balance trade and values particularly when you have this rising hostility between china and the united states i wanted to get your comment about that that uh, that bind of values versus interests but also to reflect a little on what mr beasley had had to say there about being pulled in different directions if you like the potentially uh, potential of being towed along by a greater or mounting american hostility towards china um, the expectation that we would be in lockstep with that we've heard comments to that degree from people like mike pompeo or of course then risking the ire of china who have already retaliated against attempts by us to push back against China's actions in Hong Kong, for instance. And that's having a real implication when it comes to trade with restrictions on various products that are already applied to us. If we are in the crosshairs of this, is it so much more difficult now to be able to say that we can, in fact, balance values and interests in a constructive well, way? Well, my answer to that is twofold. Uh, we can. And of equal importance, we must, mm. because it is in our national interest to preserve a strong trading relationship with the most populous country in the world, which is a major ongoing consumer uh, of Australian commodities. And, and that trading relationship was crucial to the capacity of Australia to more or less survive the global financial crisis of more than 10 years ago, more or less survived that without any significant damage. And we've got to keep that in our mind. And we have been successful in doing it to date. And there's no reason to believe that we can't 
go on being successful. It's harder now because the Chinese are more overtly aggressive with their diplomatic language and with their behaviour in the South China Seas. But um, we have to understand that. We don't want to overreact to it, but equally we don't want to recoil from it. I don't think we've been dragged along by the Americans. Mm. It's important to understand that our values and the American values are broadly the same. I mean, we are both liberal democracies. There'll be partisan debate about whether we're emphasising this much to this area too much. But, but the truth is we think more or less the same as we do with other like-minded countries around the world. But remember that, for example, dealing with, with Huawei, um, it's some years ago now that Australian intelligence services started warning about that. It's nothing new. We didn't get that from the Americans, I can tell you. Uh, the Australian intelligence service was wrong. If, if a country has been brought on side in relation to that recently, it's the United Kingdom. and and and. In the way Australia has led, and, and Australia took quite an assertive position in relation to an international inquiry into the origins of the pandemic, that wasn't driven by Washington. Uh, so I think we can see ourselves as having um, respectively um, battered very effectively on our own in relation to a lot of these things, but it, it just happens that in many areas, we think the same as the Americans. Not because we count out of them, it's because we believe in the same thing. We believe in democracy. We believe in, in, in treating people fairly. We believe in international cooperation. We uh, believe in the aspirations of developing countries. Now, it's not rocket science to imagine that if you have two countries that think like that, we more or less talk the same language, our sense of humour is a lot different, but uh, we won't get into that. <laughs> the former ambassador know all about uh, the discord between the Australian and the American sense of humour. But um, the truth is, we, we we are very similar peoples, and and therefore we're going to think and react. And the big change within the I suppose the reach of the bilateral relationship between America and China has come from China. I mean, I can. I've never forgotten attending the APEC meeting in Shanghai at about just a few bare weeks after the terrorist attack in September of 2001. And that meeting was hosted by President Jiang Zemin. He conducted the entire proceedings in English. He delivered his speech in English and he was reaching out to the United States. Now, it was changing his doctrine, he wasn't apologising for being an ardent Chinese communist, but I, I, I've never forgotten that the mood was one of people coming together across this vast historical and political divide uh, to meet a common threat. And uh, would that happen now? I don't know. I'd like to think it would. I got, as the Scots say, I got the dupes. Mr. Howard, I'll stay with you on that, and then I'll come back to Mr. Beasley in just a moment. But to the extent that China has changed, um, it is one thing to say that Australia can balance interests and values and navigate that both diplomatically and, and also economically. But of course, this is not just all down to us. It's also what China does. Are there lines that cannot be crossed? Uh, we've seen China locking up a million weakers, for instance, in what human rights groups have called re-education or detention camps. We've seen the attempts to crush dissent inside Hong Kong and applying new security laws there that can be interpreted very liberally. We've seen the warnings to Taiwan increasing from Xi Jinping about any move toward independence on Taiwan. You mentioned the South China Sea. At what point are lines necessary to be drawn or not? How do we navigate that? And to what extent do we say enough is enough? And what risks are there in, in us doing well, that? Well, I, I doubt that we'll ever get to a situation where unilaterally without uh, discussion and consultation with others, Australia is going to say enough is enough um, uh, in, 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 in the context of a, 
a broader confrontation between our country and China. We must you know, do everything we humanly can, both unilaterally and cooperation with others to stop that occurring. Look, I, I think looking into the future, and I, I can't really answer the issue on which there might be a real flashpoint between the United States and Taiwan, except the uh, United States and China. I gave the game away by saying Taiwan. I think Taiwan is a real issue between those two countries because of the history. And um, that will be something that administrations uh, in the past and in the future will have to work hard on. Uh, I, I don't think China wants a hot war. I don't, because there's nothing in it for the Chinese people. Uh, and uh, I don't think even the current Chinese government wants a hot war. Nobody does. But um, the current government in China is internationally behaving in a more ramrod, assertive way than its predecessors, and that is the real difference. Is it hard uh, to um, maintain that balance? Of course it's hard. It's probably harder now than it was some years ago because of the more belligerent attitude of the Chinese government. But um, I know from past experience, and no doubt Tim Beasley does too, that, that um, when it comes to the crunch, what might look like being um, you know, the irresistible force meeting the immovable object is somehow or other avoided. And uh, I had examples of that uh, in relation to an attempt by a Chinese diplomat at the consulate in Sydney to be given political asylum. And I was told by the Chinese then that if we gave him political asylum, that the world would come to an end as far as the bilateral relationship is concerned. Well, uh, we gave him political asylum following the proper processes, which were respected by both sides of politics in Australia. And the world did not come to an end. The world continued on in, in a normal fashion between the two of us. So and that was in a different age under a different leadership. But you're going to get these sort of um, confrontations and um, you just have to try and do with them the best you can, remembering that it is in the national interest of Australia that we maintain a good relationship with China, but a good relationship based on national self-respect uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Beasley, just want to pick up uh, on something Mr. Howard said there. We are getting some, some questions and commentary coming in from, from our viewers and our audience here. The issue of a hot war, one, one uh, person says here, whilst neither America and China uh, might want a hot war, it certainly appears to be heading that way. Um, just a few years ago, the Rand Corporation think tank put out a, a document called Thinking the Unthinkable war with china and the united states that is not so not inc incredibly um unthinkable now is it and you're a, a great student of history as mr howard is you know there is something that's been widely discussed the thucydides trap the, the the law of history if you like that says a rising power meets a waning power and there is some inevitability to conflict do you hold to that view I think that the the core problem here that might lead to a hot war is Taiwan. Uh, I don't think at the end of the day anything in the South China Seas is likely to do that. I think the Chinese would step back from anything there. And already there is a line drawn on Taiwan. The United States drew a line on Taiwan a long time ago. And that was uh, a, a line which said that while it was recognised that Taiwan was part of China, any attempt to resolve that issue by force would be dealt with. So that's a line that's been drawn. You ask, do we have any lines drawn around the place? That's one drawn by the United States mm. on China. So presumably, if that line is crossed, uh, then the United States would do something about it. Does that does that still, still hold? Sorry, do, do you believe well, that? And well, what implications well, would that have for Australia? I, with one answers? would hope it would not be tested. I, I, this is where I agree with John. But at the end of the day, there are a lot of these lines drawn here and there. But on the whole, uh, when it looks as though there are two sides about to clash inevitably, they don't. But you can always, uh, you always have to take account of the possibility of accident. 
And hot wars are not off the agenda, not just there, but in other places uh, around the globe. Life's like hard. It, it's going to be very hard for um, our diplomats, our national security officials, Americans, Chinese, everyone, to ensure that that situation is contained to the point where you don't produce a major regional conflagration. I, do, I don't think that the Chinese or the Americans would see that conflagration as a good thing to happen, but it's quite possible that it could occur. And therefore, it is necessary to say, as, as uh, I've just said, as John just said, and as I, I, I think Americans would say that China needs to take that into its consideration, even as it pursues that quite uh, uh, formidable policy around its core interests. I've got to say back here for Australia, I think we understand our problems and our issues very well. I think our counterintelligence is good and increasingly focused. I think our cyber capabilities are world class. Uh, we are capable of defending ourselves. I had the experience of, uh, of being at the Cyber Centre at Edith Cowan University a couple of weeks ago. And they had a big map of the globe up with various movements of, uh, uh, of what looked like cyber attacks around the globe and honeypots and all this sort of thing. And we're walking past the board and Craig Valley, who's the bloke who heads it up, suddenly turns, looks at it and points and said, that doesn't look good. And what he was pointing to was the cyber attack on Australia. Now, this is, a pro this is an organisation that's not government, not official, but uh, it could be, he detected it immediately and Mr Morrison talked about it the next day. And um, let's say we are very good when it uh, comes to cyber. That's one of the things. We talk about attacks on us and we talk about problems, weaknesses and the rest of it. We hardly ever talk about strengths and that's the strength. So we are, and then our laws, I think, on foreign influence and the rest of it are pretty strong and that they, of course, have to be enforced. We and now our, we have recalibrated the direction of our defence policy towards not an aggressive stance against China, but a willingness to protect ourselves and to raise the threshold of our level of dependence, at least in combat, on the United States so that we are becoming a better ally as we're an ally that is not going to at any stage display a level of weakness that requires them to spend blood as well as treasure in coming to our defence. So I think we are one of the better players globally now on all fronts. We are emerging as a substantial middle power and a substantial middle power not simply in actual capabilities but in the common sense of our leadership. And that has been massively on display during this pandemic, the common sense and restraint of our leadership. And uh, I don't think you can point to any other country around the globe, frankly, outside perhaps you know, Taiwan and, and, uh, and South Korea, one or two in their responses. I don't think you can point to anyone who's, where the political leadership has tried to take less advantage politically of the opportunities that emerge and to stress more unity. So, for example, you see that, uh, that Morrison is Prime Minister, is not taking advantage of the difficulties of the Labor government in Victoria. You see here in Western Australia, minimal criticism of the opposite political party in charge of affairs in, in Canberra. What you see is a devotion to first principles which is that we will survive, prosper, and be defended as a community. And um, that's, that puts us, I think, in a powerful talking position. And we are in a powerful talking position on the America-China issues. And we should not be afraid to say what we think is important, but we also need to point out to the Chinese certain histories in our relationship. We have done nothing but wish the Chinese good in their economic development and done the best we can for them. And we've given thousands of Chinese students nation-building skills uh, through our education system. Only when I was the ambassador did, I, did we see for the first time the Americans in absolute numbers, not relative numbers, absolute numbers pass us narrowly 
in training young Chinese. And I think we're probably back in front again on that front. So you, we, we have been of enormous assistance in the growth of China. And, uh, and frankly, that gives us something to talk to them about. And our views heard on that. At the same time, we say what we need to say about the terrible things happening to the Uyghurs, the terrible things happening in Hong Kong, and the unacceptable things that uh, are occurring in the South China Seas. We need to be confident. Mr. Howard, um, as Mr. Beasley, you're a, you're a great reader of history, and you've written history, indeed. Uh, and, and in your 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 book on on Menzies, and you were you were talking about writing history forward, um, being able to make decisions. Uh, you 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 talked about the decision to commit Australian troops to Vietnam, for instance, because of a perceived threat, uh, and perhaps a real threat as well, of communist infiltration of Southeast Asia. Are we not seeing that? Now, with the Chinese increasing influence in the Pacific, uh, the South China Sea claiming the disputed islands, militarising the disputed islands. If if you are if you are you able to to take that historical moment uh, when decisions were made for Australia's defensive interests aligned with the United States, and overlay that to what we are seeing now. I think it's always um, wise to understand history, and it's always wise to draw lessons from history. One of the lessons you ought to draw from history is not to misapply it to a current situation. And um, whilst there are some similarities between the current situation and the situation in our part of the world uh, in the 1960s, there are a lot of differences. In the, the great concern in the 1960s was encapsulated in the so-called domino theory, whereby one by one countries would fall. And uh, until he died, uh, the great Lee Kuan Yew uh, held the view that American action in Vietnam had prevented uh, far worse outcomes in his country, in Malaysia and in Indonesia now. I don't want to ignite a debate on that. We, we're, we're 50, 60 years on from that. But my point is that you, you have to understand history and you should apply uh, the conventional lessons of history when it is right to apply it. But you don't want to fall into the trap of applying it when it isn't right. Now, I think the situation now is one that we have to be guided by history, but we have to understand we're dealing with uh, yeah. China now, which is infinitely more powerful than the China was in the 1960s. And, and the history, of course, of the Vietnam War will tell you that probably Soviet Russia, as it then was, had a gr much greater influence on uh, the North Vietnamese government and the Viet Cong uh, than did the Chinese. And that you know, a lot of historians who are critical of American and Australian involvement in Vietnam uh, constantly point that out. So we have to look at the current circumstances, and we're dealing with a set where we have two great powers. One, our historic ally in the United States, whose values and aspirations we broadly share, but we don't slavishly follow. Uh, and China, uh, a country that we have demonstrated uh, an adroitness in dealing with over the last 30 or 40 years. I mean, we, we, we have done on balance well in the relationship with China. As Kim Beasley pointed out, we've done a lot to help the Chinese and that's understood. And I can say from my own experience as Prime Minister that we had our own separate identity when dealing with the countries of Asia. We weren't seen as just an automatic ally of the United States. We weren't you know, the big power and we weren't the former colonial power. We were Australians. The fact that we had close links with the United States and, 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 and also the United Kingdom. We're seen in many cases by Asian countries as pluses, not as minuses, but we were seen as distinctively Australian and we had our own way of dealing with it. And that's what I think we have to remember as we you know, negotiate our way through the next few years. But there are distinctive Australian credits uh, in, in the relationship with China. They're not Western credits, they're Australian credits. And the fact that we 
are seen in higher education in countries like the United States as having been successful. Some of my experiences of visiting there a lot over the last 10 years uh, has taught me that they admire the way that we were able to get so many foreign students. We Now, okay, we've got a bit of an issue at the moment and you can debate about the relative weight that universities in Australia place on the revenue from overseas students. But the truth is that all of these things have built those Australian credits. Now, we don't want to squander those credits, but equally we want to understand that they do exist and they should sustain us when we resolve to stand up to the Chinese on issues that are important. And I give full marks uh, to the Morrison government for the way in which it's done that and, and to its predecessor governments that, that broadly followed the same approach. Mr. Howard, I'll just stay with you and then come back to Mr. Beasley. I want to discuss when you talk about the Morrison government and decisions that are being made, the recent announcements on defence, $250 billion extra being spent over the next 10 years, increasing our weaponry, particularly when it comes to, to, to submarines, uh, missiles and so on. Um, is that, in your view, a, a direct response to what we are seeing with a more, in your words, belligerent China? Is that what that is about? countering and preparing for the worst possible outcomes, if, it did, if indeed it did come to that, with China. To some degree, but not totally. And I, I would be wrong to see the defence build up uh, as, as being specifically anti-Chinese. I don't think the government tended it that way. I don't think the government wanted to be seen that way. There are uh, generic national defence interests. Yes. that change from generation to generation and you've always got to service those interests. But obviously, Chinese belligerence has given uh, a certain point to it. And uh, Kim Beasley, it, when, it, when he talked about uh, the, the growth of Australia as a very powerful, effective middle power, part of being a powerful, effective middle power uh, is to have a capacity to um, exhibit power when needed. And, and you can't do that without spending money on defence. And uh, I don't think there'd be any disagreement uh, between my co-presenter and I today on this broader issue than uh, when it comes to spending what's needed on defence. And, and for a long, long time, we all forget it now, but for a long, long time, uh, not too long after World War II, Australia did lag uh, in defence spending compared with the expenditure of the United States and and, and, and the UK and, and, and others. And, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've got to accept that if we're going to assert ourselves and defend our values, you have to invest in defence. And I welcome mm. the commitment. And I, and I welcome, uh, as far as I read it, it's, uh, the announcements made by the Prime Minister have been supported by the Labor opposition. Uh, and uh, when I read things that are said by is it Richard Miles, who's the defence spokesman. He's broadly supportive of what the government has said and done. I mean, you can debate um, investment in particular hardware. That's a, that can be a separate issue. But uh, the broad thrust of that announcement, I think it is significantly, but certainly not totally influenced by Chinese assertiveness. Mr. Beasley, um, of course, you were Defence Minister for a very long time in the, the Hawke government, um, and I hope I'm not being disrespectful in recalling your nickname at the time, Bomber, Bomber Beasley. Um, but uh, if we're reflecting on what Mr. Howard has said there, two things. Your thoughts on whether this, in fact, is directed at what is perceived as an increasing China threat, but also the question of, of defence spending going forward. The Obama administration had asked Australia to do more and had pushed back against what they saw as free riding, if you like, on American spending and power. And certainly the Trump administration, both with NATO and also in our region, has also expected its allies and partners to pull more weight. Are we going to see increasingly more spending on, on defence? And, and, and what we've seen thus far and the strategy, the spending and what we are spending on is this the right direction? Well, I think it's the right direction. Let, let me just say this, that uh, I think we're probably well over 2% at the moment, I might say. Mm. Given the increase, uh, I think we're probably pushing three, to be frank, at the moment. We'll see when the government brings down its numbers on this and that with a budget. But um, that, that's arriving at that conclusion in the most unpleasant of ways. 
it has to be said. Look, uh, China is, is one of the powers in the region creating a particular atmospheric and it also has certain capabilities. I used to always say, because every time you spend or, or direct your defence spending in some dramatic way, somebody around is going to feel that you're aiming at them. What we always used to say back in the 80s was, we are driven by being able to match capabilities that are there within the region. Well, what I'd say about the, the government's decisions recently in their announcements is they are being driven by the capabilities that are there in the region. Uh, intentions is another matter, and uh, intentions can change overnight, but what cannot change overnight is capabilities. And if you don't have the capacity to match the capabilities in the region, you're dead. That's the, uh, that's the, the gravamen of the subject. And um, what, uh, uh, what they're uh, doing, which I think is particularly important, is, is going into an area of capability of, of a very high technology uh, level, a sort of fifth generation weapon system uh, type level. And one of the things that I think that is a challenge for the government and a challenge for us, and part of our response to COVID and sovereign capability and all the rest of it, is we do actually have to move into this of technologies, as well as the technologies associated with reconnaissance, uh, uh, but we're, we're actually pretty good in that area. We actually have to be able to develop uh, a capacity to build stocks at home. Now that is a very difficult negotiation uh, that has to take place principally with our ally, because we need production facilities here to have the sort of stocks that we need if we're going to be able to have the deterrent effect that the government wishes to have. So there's a lot of challenges uh, there for the government in what we are doing. But I, I think that um, we, it's good that we've got bipartisanship on it. Uh, and there are going to be challenges because the budget is a total mess. Uh, I'm not blaming anyone for that, but it's the circumstances in which we find ourselves. And sooner or later, over the next couple of years, there's going to be arguments about the size of the deficit. And uh, so there'll be arguments about how you should achieve a deficit that is more acceptable to you. It's not going to be a problem for the next year or two, but it will be a problem. And we have to make certain, because if this thing is going to work, that the government has announced, they've announced a 10-year program. And if we falter at any point along the way, their objectives are simply not going to be achieved. And if they are not achieved, we will not have security. And if we do not have security, our voice in this region counts for very much less. The point about being able to be effectively a deterrent power, not an aggressive power, a deterrent power, is it means that when people are saying and doing things that you find unacceptable, uh, uh, they are given caution and they're less likely to do things that are unacceptable if you are, a, uh, if you are effective. To say the least, I think that countries like Indonesia and our older allies like Malaysia and Singapore, they were enormously pleased by that direction because we are beginning to become their bulwark. They are beginning to have their own issues and they know that privately if they don't overtly say it publicly. Having a strong Australia around is getting more and more important to them. So we have not done ourselves any damage in the direction in which we're going. The point, though, is that we're going in that direction simply because we have to deal with capabilities that are there now in the region. Mr Howard, we're getting some, some questions and some comments coming in about India uh, and India's importance to the region. You've talked a lot about values and India, notwithstanding some of the questions that are being raised at the moment about, about Modi and some of the tensions that are emerging there, is a democratic country that shares broadly Australia's values, including something that you'd be interested in, cricket. Uh, but, uh, but India's been involved in border skirmishes with China and very recently Indian troops have died as a result of that. Uh, we've seen India carrying out military exercises with the United States and maritime exercises recently. One of the questions here was whether you would support India's elevation to the UN Security Council as an additional permanent member, but also about India's role in the region, trade-wise, security-wise, and whether how much more that should be a focus. Well, I'll answer the first part of the question by saying yes, I would, but I don't think it's going to be a live issue uh, for quite some time. 
and the permanent membership of the Security Council reflected the world uh, at the end of 19, at World War II in 1945. And um, to, to break that open, uh, to the extent that that should be a high priority, uh, and I don't think it is something that ought to be a high priority, it's important, break that out be very difficult. But look, India uh, is, is, is a fascinating country. And if, if I can just mention the experience I had with former Indian Prime Minister Ranaran Singh in New Delhi, when he said to me in a very, very thoughtful way, he said, uh, uh, Prime Minister, um, India and Australia have a lot in common, but we haven't had much to do with each other. And, and one of the reasons that, for that diplomatically is for a long time after India became independent, she tended to align herself with the Soviet bloc on a lot of international issues, despite her democratic heritage. Now that, of course, has changed over the years. The border conflict with China is nothing new. Uh, that's, that's almost as old, perhaps as old as the dispute between Pakistan and India over Kashmir has just been there for a long time. I would like to see opportunities taken for greater cooperation uh, between India and like-minded countries in the region. I was in favour of expanding the former trilateral security dialogue between America, Japan and Australia. I would would like to have seen that expanded to include India, and I know there are noises now being made about that perhaps occurring. Um, India is fascinating in that it's economically almost been about to take off for quite a while, but there isn't the same economic complementarity between Australia and India. Much and all as we share wonderful things such as cricket, a legal system, a federation, parliamentary democracy, and, and I am in awe of, of, of uh, India's fealty to uh, parliamentary democracy. When you think of a huge country, you know, with, with, with some poisonous religious and tribal uh, rivalries, when you think of how apart from a very brief period of time, when Mrs. Gandhi imposed a state of emergency, India has remained faithful to democracy uh, since becoming independent in 1947. And uh, you know, I, 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 I can only see an upside in the relationship with India, and I, I would like to see it, and, and not uh, obviously to the exclusion of the other countries of the subcontinent, such as Pakistan and Bangladesh, but India, of course, has more democratic stability, and certainly than Pakistan. Pakistan has enormous uh, governance challenges, and uh, you know, one has to have real concerns about the way in which uh, extremism is, is dealt with in sections of that country. Uh, Mr. Beasley, we, we talk a lot about Asia Pacific. We don't talk as much about Indo-Pacific. And of course, as I mentioned, um, the United States is uh, now engaged in maritime exercises with India. Um, but I, I wanted to, to look more broadly as well about the United States, our relationship with the US, questions about US American power, US power and prestige in the region. And, and you've written in the past that our relationship has been formed in an era of massive US dominance. But as power becomes more diffuse, it feeds a perception of the diminishing value of the relationship, whether or not it's worth spending political capital sustaining it. Uh, the US default position in our region, uh, we must look at when it is not necessarily preeminent how do you see America, our relationship, America's capacity uh, to be able to influence events in the in the world or intervene to the extent that it was in the past? Well, let, let, let me say that um, uh, whilst I absolutely hold to that piece of analysis I gave, I think you'd find that I might go on to argue that the United States, when it's in a position where it's not necessarily predominant, has always shown itself to be quite a useful friend for Australia, to wit, uh, the Battle of the Coral Sea, when they had four or five aircraft carriers available to them, as opposed to the Japanese 17 fleet and auxiliary carriers, they nevertheless decided to risk two of them defeating us. I quite like that. 
I think that's an indication of a, uh, a pretty sincere potential friend and ally. And I think in many ways, from their point of view, they would see us as just about the last country in the Pacific that they'd want to give up a relationship with. And uh, that's, that's an important attribute. I don't think any of the plan of Mr. Morrison on defence works without the United States. It doesn't. Um, we'd have to move into a totally different concept of Australian defence if we didn't have access to American intelligence and technology. Uh, I don't need necessarily think and we ought not to position ourselves in a way where we need access to their arms uh, we, in terms of their personnel, uh, but we do need access to the other two if we're actually going to be able to build the sort of defence uh, that, uh, that we need to build. Also, we do need the coverage of their system of extended nuclear deterrence. And if we did not have that, a whole different debate would emerge in this country, let me tell you, uh, which would be a very unpleasant one indeed uh, were, were it to occur. So we have to build that relationship with them. The thing that I've always found with the United States is they actually ask us for very little. Uh, we ask them constantly for a lot and we nag them and we push them and uh, we argue with them. Uh, as as uh, I'm sure uh, the, the former prime minister would have found, uh, we often find ourselves in a situation with the Americans where while the arguments are... Uh, differences may be subtle, the differences are there nevertheless. And these are things that we push, we tend to push them in private, not in public. The United States is going to be a great power for my lifetime and well beyond it. And um, the question is, how will it choose to exercise that power? And at the moment, what the United States seems to be doing, and I think the Trump administration drives this a bit harder because at least Trump doesn't like NATO, doesn't particularly want to involve himself in Europe, I think the American orientation is towards the Asia-Pacific and the prioritisation uh, is given to Asia and the Pacific. So I don't think the Americans are going to part here anytime soon. And uh, they see their interests deeply bound up here. Uh, again, Mr Trump does not see the relationship he, with, he has with Japan and South Korea as terribly important and it annoys him in many of its facets, but he is alone in that. There is nobody else in American politics who takes that particular, that particular point of view. So there's plenty of pressure on him to, uh, to be supportive of them. So I, I do think that for the foreseeable, for my lifetime and beyond it, we can rely on the United States for the basic things we need in relation to our defence, we pay for them, we contribute to them. We're very good in many areas of high-tech research. Uh, and we also have a couple of critical minerals here, which if they actually seriously want to get off the Chinese hook, they'll take some interest in developing. For example, rare earths. We have a massive here in gettable qualities of a greater purity than China. Uh, those rare earths are entirely obtained from China by the United States, and there are 3,400 American weapon systems. Uh, not everything in relations between China and the United States readily meets the eye. That's one of them. And yet we have here the capacity to transplant that, but the United States is not really moving from that with any degree of alacrity, but they are beginning to understand it. So I think that though the US power relatively is waning, absolutely it's not. And that's Mr. Howard, I'll, I'll come to you on that as well. Um, of course, the United States is still by, by a long way, the most powerful military in the world. And despite the rise of China, it is still for now, the biggest economy in the world. And in fact, Australia's biggest investment partner as well, while China is our biggest trading partner. But it has been written that we are entering a post American world that America has to now share power with, of course, China, but also Russia, particularly in parts of the Middle East. And there are tensions between the United States under Donald Trump and, and partners uh, such as NATO. Um, do you believe that this is a post-American world in terms of American hegemony? And how 
what does that mean for the world to have a multipolar political uh, political power well, structure? I profoundly reject the notion that we're entering a post-American world. Uh, I think people have constantly underestimated the capacity of the American nation to recover, regenerate, reinvigorate. Um, the idea that uh, America won't be the dominant power in the world, both militarily and economically, in 50 years' time has never been one I'd subscribe to, largely because I think there are two big challenges China has now. I could be entirely wrong. I think the first great challenge China has is demography. China is an ageing country, um, and it will take decades before any uh, adjustments to the one-child policy in China begin to turn that ocean liner around, if I can mix my metaphor, it'll be the the slowest turning ocean liner of the 21st century, Chinese demography. Uh, and you compare that with um, uh, even the United States made the most dramatic and direct comparison. Uh, demography is all on the side of the United States um, compared with China, not so with Europe, not so incidentally with some Asian countries, but certainly the United States. That's the first point I'd make. And the other reason why I think the notion that China will overwhelm the United States in economic power uh, is I hold of what some might call the old fashioned notion that if you are born into poverty and you inherit relative affluence, you might put up in your lifetime with being told what to do. But if you are born into relative freedom and people try and continue to tell you what to do and if you're born into relative freedom and affluence you're going to react against it and i think there will eventually be this denouement in in china uh, you're seeing it of course occurring in a, a particularly vivid way in hong kong um, you are seeing it to some degree playing out in taiwan and i just think that the idea that china can continue for another 50 years being economically liberal and open, which it clearly sees its national economic interests as wanting, uh, and politically dictatorial and authoritarian. I, I don't think that can last. I don't think they... Mm -hmm. Now, there are many people, I'm sure, in the audience who utterly reject this and say, oh, no, you don't understand there's a new Chinese model and so forth. Well, OK, maybe there is a new Chinese model. Uh, how long has it been going for? It's been going for a few years and it's been ramped up in the last five or six years. We'll wait and see, but that's my view about the future. Mm. I, uh, I, I, I can't see um, uh, America surrendering her relative strength rather than hegemony or something like that, relative strength for China. Mr. Howard, let's look at the, the Trump factor. Um, and I'm quoting you here in 2016 that you you didn't think that he would win the election um, against Hillary Clinton and you quote trembled at the thought of him becoming president uh, has anything in the past four years um, changed your mind on that and do you tremble at the thought of him being well um, can I do with those in sequence and um, I did say all of those things I didn't think he'd win I didn't think that he would get the Republican nomination um, uh, but having got the Republican nomination, I thought he would lose, but he didn't. Um, since he's become president, I've, uh, I've used an old Latin word called seriatim, which means you judge him clause by clause. I think Donald Trump has done some very good things. We were talking earlier, Kim Beasley was about uh, defence expenditure. He rightly called out the Europeans on defence spending. That's why he doesn't like NATO because the NATO countries have been, for um, um, want of a better expression, bludging on America for defence expenditure for years. And he said, it's about time um, uh, you lot spent more on defence. And he's been absolutely right in relation to that. I think he's, his willingness to you to retaliate against the um, Syrian regime when it crossed the line on, 
on, on poison gas. I thought that was courageous. Uh, I think his, his general policy um, in relation to um, uh, China has been under... Um, he's not a globalist, but then neither are the Chinese. Uh, I can understand but not necessarily agree with a lot of his trade moves. Now, there are some of the things that you might give him a for. And I think his economic reforms, his tax reforms, his deregulation, uh, I, I'd sign up to all of that. On the other hand, of course, he, he does show a lack of public grace uh, on a lot of occasions, and that's a necessary commodity for any political leader, uh, for any American president. And, and, and I think he's, uh, I don't think his handling of the pandemic has been up to scratch. It really has not. And, and in, Indeed, on, on the pandemic, sir, you've, you've said that he has lost oh, I, some support. I, 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 I would have thought at the beginning, being very frank, at the beginning of the year, that his prospects for re-election were strong because of his economic performance and his you know, strong suit was the booming American economy. Now, because of the pandemic, it's no longer booming. No economy is booming at the moment because of the pandemic. And that obviously affects it. Now, the fact that it's not his fault, in inverted commas, uh, is hardly the point. People deal with realities and they tend to lash out uh, with the person who's in charge when they've got an opportunity. So, um, I think that the difficulty, if I can be very candid with all of you as I have to be, the difficulty is the choice. Uh, I think uh, Joe Biden, who I, I, know, I don't know him well, but I, I know him and I respect him, a lot of what he's done and Kim would know him far better because he would have dealt with him. He gives me the impression that he'll find the job quite hard to handle. Uh, I don't think he's an, in, an effective presenter uh, and that will... Uh, enable him to be painted as being um, under the control of more left-wing, more radical uh, elements of the Democratic Party. There's a sense that a bit of an accommodation was reached with the Bernie Sanders followers in uh, settling on Biden as the Democratic nomination. So the choice could well work in Trump's favour. Um, I'm Glad I don't have a vote uh, in the election. I think it would be quite a difficult choice. I mean, my normal disposition would be to vote for a, you know, a sensible Republican, not not exclusion of a, a crack or Democrat, but it's a different political choice. Uh, but uh, I, I think to be very candid, I, Biden is, is not a convincing alternative. For all that can be said about Donald Trump, and a lot can be said about him, uh, particularly in relation to the pandemic, and and I, I didn't really think the, the the gesture in relation to the Bible outside the president's church was was good. Um, it's not the sort of thing that uh, I think an American president should have done. Uh, but uh, I can equally uh, understand his reaction against some of the the lawlessness in his country, but that is not new. I mean, if you study American history, you've, in the 1960s, which was a terrible decade for the United States, far more debilitating than anything we've got at the moment. They had continued agony over the Vietnam War. You have the assassination early of President Kennedy, and then you have the assassination of his brother, the assassination of Martin Luther King, and you had all the rights. I mean, that was an awful decade. And you have the collapse of Lyndon Johnson's presidency. So if you think there are problems in the United States now, just think back to what it was in the 1960s mm. and understand how America came through all of that. And if I can say so, ended up in that producing in Ronald Reagan, one of the truly great presidents that the United States has had. But then that's a very partisan comment. Mr. Beasley, you were you were stronger. You were you used stronger language. Uh, about Donald Trump um, at, the, at the, the last election, rather than trembling, you said you described his presidency potentially as terrifying. He lies virtually every time he puts out a presentation on anything. And you worried that he could be a security threat. Are you terrified about him being re-elected? 
Um, I'm now governor of a state, and uh, <laughs> that obliges me to be more restrained in the language uh, that we use. Uh, and I do firmly adhere to the view that it is the business of Australians whom the Australians elect to power, and it is the business of the Americans whom the Americans elect to power, and uh, our business is ours and theirs is theirs. Having said that analytically, I think he's in trouble. Um, and I think it's interesting yesterday to watch his switch on the pandemic. But having mocked uh, face masks for months now, he suddenly came out and said, put them on, that's what you've all got to do. And uh, he seemed to change his line quite, quite dramatically. So he sees where his weakness is. But I think, and he has also said uh, more realistically than most of what he says, this is going to get worse before it gets better. Um, I, I think he's a, I, I think he's a president the Americans are having enormous difficulty with. Um, I don't think, I, I have a different view from, from uh, John on Biden. I knew him quite well uh, when I was ambassador and saw him quite often. He's a very intelligent guy. He's basically as prepared for presidency as anyone can be. He'll have his own party there behind him, and there's, there are different wings in that party which will be uh, pulling him in different directions. But the president has enormous authority, and so will he. His vice president, presidential candidate will be important. And uh, I think a lot of people are going to look at him via his vice president. This never happens in American elections, but for once it might. Mm. So it will be unprecedented in that sense if he wins. And if Trump wins, it'll be unprecedented in another sense. Nobody's come from being solidly 10% behind in the polls four months out and actually won. This was not Hillary Clinton's position. Biden is not disliked in the way Hillary Clinton was disliked. And uh, there are certainly on the right in American politics, there are the criticisms of him that, that John made, and that will no doubt feature in, in people's views. But where he is strong is in the suburbs. Now, Trump beat Hillary Clinton in the suburbs by about 4%. Biden is currently leading him by 8 to 10 now, if that persists or merely just comes back to even Stevens, Trump's gone. Uh, this is going to be a very difficult election for Trump to win and um, it, a more difficult one than the one that he won previously and he only just won that. But one of the things I did say as we started here today was this, watch the Americans carefully, more carefully than we do. Trump is not the Congressional Republican Party, though they're cowed by him. They have different views on many things, China being one of them. Trump is not quite of their views on China, and obviously uh, Biden certainly would not be. There will be, one way or another, a different American approach after this election is over, even though the hostilities to China will be super hot over the course of the next, uh, the next four months. Uh, Trump will not emerge doing the sorts of things in regard to China that people like Marco Rubio want him to do. So, so he, he's a bloke. You've got to watch very carefully, but any American president you have to, because you need to factor those things into your calculations because they affect so many of ours. Gentlemen, we have about 15 minutes left, and I want to touch on some of the the other questions that have been coming in. Um, we've been reflecting broadly in our discussion, some of the questions and comments have been coming in from our, our audience, but we must talk about, about Indonesia. Um, Mr. Howard, of course, you had to negotiate relations with Indonesia, particularly around questions of, of East Timor. It's on track to become the fourth biggest economy in the world. It's also dealing with navigating uh, this contested region and the rise of China and China and the United States. Often our relationship with Indonesia has been framed around crisis. It, it enters into the consciousness whenever there is a crisis. We're not as fluent uh, politically or linguistically with Indonesia as we should be given our, its proximity. How do you see that relationship? Well, we are very different countries thrown by history and geography together. It, it's always been a difficult relationship. Um, it started with a lot of goodwill 
on the part of the Indonesians towards Australia because the the then uh, Curtin slash Chifley government uh, supported the aspiration of Indonesia for independence soon after the end of World War Two, and 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 that and that was a good start uh, in the at a you know, sort of government the government level. But we are very different language wise, religion wise, um, economically, and it's always going to be hard because two of the closest possible neighbours uh, to have um, Indonesia, which is really the third largest democracy in the world after the United States and India. And I think Indonesia deserves a lot more credit than it's received from the rest of the world for its transition uh, from uh, a military dictatorship. When I personalising the response, first became Prime Minister of Australia, um, General Sahato was the military dictator and then he disappeared. And by the time uh, I, uh, I left office, uh, you had um, Cicillo Fabiano, Udiano, SPY, and, and he'd been elected by the Indonesian people. And the transition was quite amazing. And, and uh, the Indonesians deserve a lot of credit. Once again, the differences arise because <clears throat> there are cultural and religious differences. And, you know, the, the average Australian often thinks of the Indonesian relationship in terms of arguments about the treatment of drug offenders in Indonesia because they're the things that get them. We have this sad situation where many young Australians just refuse to accept that whatever their views may be, when you are in another country, you have to accept the laws of that country and the attitude of many countries in Asia and the Indonesian government is no exception to this, is to adopt a very hard line when it comes to the treatment of drug offenders. And they can't understand the uh, reluctance of uh, Australians to appreciate that. I think we will continue to have a, a difficult but steadily improving relationship with Indonesia. I, I, I welcome the attempts that have been made by current Prime Minister and his predecessors to have a good personal relationship with President of Indonesia because that is very, very important. But we, we shouldn't kid ourselves. There are no immediate economic complementarities. We can improve uh, the foreign investment climate. But in the end, the trade does follow dollars. And, and the absence of the matching of the two economies in the way that we're matched with China, we're matched with Korea, and, and of course, a decade match with Japan, we, we can't as I see it and understand the Indonesian economy, I can't imagine that that is going to occur in relation to Indonesia. Now, if it were to, the reasons I don't fully appreciate now, that would make a big difference. But I mean, we have a close relationship with, with China and Japan economically, uh, uh, despite the vast cultural differences and historical, very sharp historical differences. So that absence of that is fundamental to the low key character, if I can put it. And therefore, it means that the differences on culture and religion and otherwise come to the fore and tend to dominate the public consciousness. Mr. Beasley, we can't have a, a, a strategic security defence conversation without considering North Korea. It is now a, a nuclear armed state. Mm -hmm. uh, it has made threats, direct threats, to Australia, I might add, as well as the United States, with the with the, the missile capacity potentially to strike as far away as Australia. Do we now have to live with the reality that North Korea is a nuclear armed state? What options are there for navigating this? We've seen Donald Trump sit down with Kim Jong-un, but that clearly hasn't yielded any lasting or concrete results. How do you see the problem of North Korea? Well, we're to one side on that in terms of the diplomacy, which is much more directly to China, the United States, Russia, North Korea. Um, you know, we, of course, don't want them to be a nuclear power. Nobody does want them to be a nuclear power except they themselves. Uh, and uh, 
we support all the efforts that are being put in place to try to persuade them to take a different course. Are they going to work? Well, we don't know. But we have no option but to continue in that regard. Though it does make those elements of uh, the white paper which talks about missile defence that much more important. Hmm. Mr Howard, um, we must talk about terrorism. We must talk about the events of 9-11 of and you being on the ground and to see the way that that altered our world. It tipped us into war in Afghanistan, which continues, war in Iraq. We've seen the fallout from that, the Arab Spring, the war in Syria, the unrest in Libya. Uh, when you reflect on that history, your role in that history, supporting the war in Iraq, how do you see those events? How do you reassess those events? And where do you see the challenge today of dealing with, with the, the consequences of Afghanistan, Iraq, the 9-11 attacks and the ongoing fight against terrorism. Well, the, the start point to the change was, of course, the both unprovoked and unexpected nature of the terrorist attack uh, in September of 2001. Now, I had I was in Washington at the time, as running public notice, and I had had my very first personal meeting, Prime Minister to President, with the then President George W. Bush the day before the terrorist attack. And in fact, I was scheduled to address a joint sitting of Congress on a Wednesday to mark the 50th anniversary of the Andes Treaty. That was my immediate reason for being in Washington. And we talked, George Bush and I talked about a lot of things, but we didn't talk about the possibility of a terrorist attack. Now, whatever that says about intelligence and all that sort of thing, people will make their own judgments, but, but it was both unprovoked in my view uh, and unexpected. And that turned uh, attitudes around dramatically. Did it turn the world on its head? Well, uh, I suppose if you want to indulge in those sort of expressions, you could say, yes, it did. And what it left in the United States from my experience of those days uh, were a number of feelings. One of uh, absolute um, dread that there was going to be another attack. But a lot of people forget that for months after uh, September 11, the Americans waited for the next attack on the American homeland. Uh, there were a lot of people at the time thought that the attacks in America would be followed by attacks in Europe, in Asia, even Australia. Uh, that's what people thought at the time. Now, when something like this happens, um, one's instinctive reactions are very important. My instinctive reaction was to say that if America chooses to retaliate against a discovered source of these attacks, Australia will stand by her side. And I said that uh, within hours of the attack having been occurred and it received total support from both sides of politics. And, and, and Kim Beasley is then the leader of the Australian Labor Party. And, and, and he shared my horror and detestation uh, what had happened. Uh, um, that, of course, was the beginning. Um, now, the war in Afghanistan has gone on for a very long time, and that's the history of any military involvement. But there was really no alternative up to the Americans to take out the Al Qaeda a presence and those who supported them in Afghanistan. The debate about Iraq, and you know, I suppose of all the things I did as Prime Minister, none has been more heavily criticised than that, and that's something where there was a difference. Um, I think what people don't understand, those who criticise the decision I took uh, to um, support uh, Bush uh, and, 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 and the British, led by Tony Blair uh, and, and, and a number of other countries, uh, to um, uh, invade Iraq was based on a belief that at some point the weapons of mass destruction, which we believed on proper intelligence grounds available to us at the time, uh, Iraq possessed might fall into the hands of some rogue elements in the Middle East or elsewhere. Now, that was a well-founded belief. Uh, the intelligence was not manufactured. I, to this day, and retaining all my files, the unclassified national intelligence assessment 
which was produced by uh, the Americans um, only a few months before the invasion took place and it presented a very compelling case. I'm reminded that when uh, President Obama was considering uh, authorising the, the mission that took out bin Laden in Abbottabad in Pakistan, one of his senior intelligence advisors said to him, you realise, Mr President, that the evidence that uh, he's there is less compelling than the evidence that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. Now, we can argue for a long time about that, but what I've always rejected is the idea that the intelligence agencies of the United States and Great Britain and Australia manufactured stories. You can say it was wrong, of course it was. A lot of intelligence is wrong. If you wait for clue perfect proof of every piece of intelligence, you, you end up with Pearl Harbor. Uh, so, um, where, where do we now? Terrorism has gone off, disappeared from the headlines because it's been replaced by, by something else. But uh, the fight against Islamic terrorism um, continues. Uh, you have to use the right methods. You have to uh, engage the sympathy and support of the great bulk of people of Islamic faith who abhor terrorism. And you've got to remember that the, the terrorists have killed a a lot of Muslims uh, since 9-11 um, uh, uh, and uh, you know I think of the, the terrible atrocity in uh, Bali that claimed the lives of 88 Australians that uh, there were many Muslims killed in that I think of all the attacks that went on in Iraq I think there was an error made in Iraq in disbanding the Iraqi army but I appreciate the constraints of time prevent us going into all of that detail so yes. look, it, it remains um, a, a fundamental challenge uh, and it will continue to be because there is little doubt that there are elements uh, of fanatical Islam which, is, which are wedded to terrorism. They should be separated from the great bulk of Islamic people, but equally we shouldn't be reluctant to call it for what it is. It is a terrorist iteration uh, of a religious faith. We're almost out of time, but I'm going to steal a couple of more minutes because we can't finish a conversation such as this, Mr. Beasley, without also considering climate change and, and the implications of that, uh, both on our world, um, our economies, but also strategically. Uh, people have, have predicted we would see flood, you know, massive refugee movements as, as people's homelands become untenable. Uh, and we have seen, have we seen, because of the, the, the headlines of COVID, the rise of China and other things, that this is not getting the attention that it should. And with Donald Trump pulling out of the Paris Accords, do we lose that that global approach to this, which so many believe is necessary? I think that's a risk uh, that we will. And it's not helpful that the United States has moved out of uh, that, uh, that discussion. I, mean, I, I completely believe in the science related to all of this, and I take some notice of it, and I also take some notice of suggestions in what we ought to do about it. Well, I'm not necessarily an optimist that we will. I believe we should, but I'm not an optimist that we will. Yes, I think it will have substantial strategic implications. If those oceans rise in the way in which you're talking, you, you've discussed, one of the countries which is going to be most threatened is one of those very deeply involved in the situation being created, and that is, of course, China. I mean, their coastal cities will be under threat. Already their river systems are drying up. And here is the nub of what will be, I think, a principal strategic problem for us. And already this is happening. And that is the diversion of the Mekong River. The, uh, all the rivers, the great rivers of Southeast and South Asia rise in Tibet, so important strategically. And already the Chinese are damming up the river heavily to, make it, to, to produce flow into their drying up river systems. They can reduce, and probably will, over the course of the next 20 years, the flow of the Mekong down through Indochina to a trickle. That happens, there is the most extraordinary crisis in Southeast Asia, and that certainly will put people on the move. So how uh, this, I will be dead when this happens, I'm confident, uh, but nevertheless, my children and grandchildren will not be. So that's going to be a substantial problem for them. The other issue we're going to have is not all countries are directly disbenefited uh, by uh, climate change. Some are uh, 
uh, I put in quotation marks, benefited. One area that will be benefited may well be the north of Australia. Uh, the modelling has not yet been done on that, but rainfall up there is going to substantially increase and turn it from, it probably turn it from desert or pastoral lands into agricultural lands. That will certainly be of interest in the, the region around us when that occurs. Likewise, I think you'll see Russia and um, Canada and North America and Alaska possibly substantially benefit from additional lands that will be available for exploration and utilisation. And uh, China, who will be massively disbenefited on every front, will then, I think, look north and, uh, and look to the old uh, territories that were seized from them in the 19th century. And there will be, when that happens, an altogether different conversation between Russia and, uh, and China. So, uh, yeah, I think, there, I think the effects are going to be profound, but they're well, probably the worst of them are well beyond my lifetime, but I can't say I'm grateful for that. I feel sad about it. Gentlemen, an hour and a half is not enough. We, we could have spent an entire day talking to both of you. Um, remarkable careers, remarkable moments that you've lived through, and uh, I, must, I must congratulate you. We've been getting some terrific comments here today, people saying how refreshing it is to see two people who've been political rivals, who have different approaches perhaps to different issues, but have engaged in a really useful conversation, disagreeing at times, but finding moments of, of agreement as well. It's been a real pleasure to speak to both of you. Thank you to everyone who has been watching. Thank you to all of your questions and your comments. Uh, I've tried to reflect the broad range of those comments and questions in our conversation and my apologies if we weren't able to get to all of it or to explore some particular areas that some of you may have explored more deeply time uh, time was of the essence but terrific to talk to both of you my very best to you thank, thank you. you so much Sam, thanks john thanks everyone you. catch up with you when i am allowed into your state yeah that's right <laughs> <laughs> that goes for all of us thank, thank you well done, Stan. great to see you